Hello, and thank you all for joining us today for another session um, from Data Week. We are excited to have Cheryl Adams, a senior content developer at Microsoft, and Raul Podoraju, principal software engineering manager at Microsoft's Azure Data um, Working Group, joining us today. Today, we will be discussing hyperspace and indexing subsystem for Spark in Azure Synapse. This session will run approximately 25 minutes. Um, questions will be held for the following session, which is an AMA. So please, if you have anything that you'd like to discuss from this session today um, during this window, just join us on the next one. We also will have an AMA in the evening if you don't have um, time to come on to the next session. Just check back. Uh, we have all the times listed on our meetup and I'll also be dropping the next session link into the chat shortly. Um, also, please note that the session has approximately a 20 to 30 second delay. Teams Live does that. So from audience, from speaker to audience, you might have a little bit of a um, hold up there. So just keep that in mind. If you are asking questions, you know, for the following session as well, just keep that in mind. Um, at the conclusion of the session, I will also be sharing a link to our feedback survey. Uh, we are the Microsoft Reactor hosting Data Week, so just let us know um, what you thought of this session and what other types of engaging content you hope for in the future. Your feedback really helps us. At this time, I will be passing the mic to Raul and Cheryl, so please stand by. Hey, thanks a lot, Rebecca. Let me share my screen. Um, Hey everyone, hope you're having a wonderful day so far. Um, my name is Rahul. Today we're going to be talking about a system called Hyperspace, which is a system that you can use today in Synapse. Let me explain a little bit about ourselves before we begin. My name is Rahul Podraju. I'm, uh, I'm from the Azure Data Team, and I'm part of the Spark team here. We're responsible for shipping uh, the Spark runtime into Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, my team also works quite significantly in the open source space. Uh, some of the prominent projects that we've been working on recently include, of course, Hyperspace, the one that we're talking about today, and uh, another project called .NET for Spark, which allows you to write C Sharp applications and then be able to run them on top of Spark. Um, over to Shadow. Hi, Cheryl, you're just still muted. Sorry about that. Thank um, you. No worries. I'm Cheryl Adams. I'm a senior content developer for the SQL Docs team. If you've looked at any content or documentation on tutorials or how to's, that's our area. Um, in addition to that, I'm a mental health, develop, health and open source advocate. Those are things I'm very passionate about and I enjoy speaking with. Um, as far as my other experiences, I've been able to do some external writing, writing about big data, and I've also been a conference presenter. Back to you, Raul. Great. Thanks a lot, Cheryl. And uh, our team at Microsoft works on everything that's Apache Spark. We, like I said, we offer Spark to our customers, and uh, at the same time, we also contribute back to Spark wherever possible. And uh, you know, majority of our of our work is open source, so feel free to follow us on GitHub. Uh, you know, ask us any questions even after the talk, and follow our work over there. So before we begin, let me just start with. You know, what is an index? Wow, you know, I'm fascinated about this too. I mean, indexes are used so often, but I wonder how complicated are they really to use? You know, that's a great question. So when I started off uh, learning about indexing, which is a couple of years ago, I, I used one example as an in, in order to get an intuitive feel for it. Let me just give you that example to see perhaps you know you might be able to uh, relate with indexing like I did. If you were to look at the textbook definition, quote unquote, of an index, it basically says it's any data structure that you can use in order to improve the speed of data retrieval at the cost of additional storage. Well, this is 
you know, when I first read this, it took me quite some time to actually understand it. So I used a more common example. Imagine, you know, we've all read textbooks. So, you know, if I wanted to find a particular topic somewhere, um, you know, rather than look at the table of contents, I used to go back to the textbook and there used to be something called as an index. And if I wanted to look up for something called optimization, where does it occur in the textbook? You know, I could pick this particular thing. It will basically point me to, hey, see plan selection. And then based on that, I can get a particular page number, right? So uh, this gave me a very intuitive feel for an index, which is if I have a, a particular keyword or some kind of a search term to look up, I could look at this particular index at the back of my textbook and it tells me immediately where is the page that you know contains this particular topic. But remember, it also says at the additional cost of like storage space, and this is your storage space because you know at the back of your textbook you're using additional space, you know, right. to capture all of this information. So I, I felt that this was a perfect example to kind of drill that you know concept inside my mind. You know, I love this example. It, it definitely reminds me of my time I spent as a data architect. So many indexes for so much information. But, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, what does an index have to do with hyperspace? I'm glad you asked. So let me give you, um, you know, an overview of hyperspace, right? So, let, you know, before I dig, dig too much into the architectural details, let me just tell you a couple of things. So indexing, if you're familiar with uh, databases like SQL Server, then indexing is something that you might have used at some point in your life. Mm -hmm. But when you start kind of looking at data lakes, there is no SQL Server. Like all of the data is actually stored in some format. It could be CSV, JSON, Parquet. And the idea behind hyperspace is to abstract away all of those details and give you quote unquote an index, uh, you know, an indexing solution that's very similar to how you get on SQL Server itself. And we don't want you to have like any expensive solutions on top of the data lake. And regardless of you know if you've worked on data lakes you will also know that spark is just one of the engines that you can use on top of a data lake the other one being if you're familiar with the the synapse product then you will know that there is also something else called synapse sql on demand or sql in, essentially and we don't want you to have all of these complexities when you start using indexing and we want to abstract away all of these things essentially and you know uh, definitely what works for you as an index in today's scenario may not really work for you like tomorrow for some other scenario essentially so we want to make sure that whenever we're building all of this hyperspace think of hyperspace as the indexing mechanism essentially. So you will use a library called hyperspace, which I'll show you in the in, in the second half of my talk. And you know, and you will end up getting all of the security, privacy, and compliance pieces. And I'll explain shortly how, how that's going to end up happening. Okay. Before I go, uh, you know, let, let me just cover uh, you know, the concept of a data lake, right? So if you're familiar with data lake, you 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 may be familiar with the fact that there are lots and lots of your data sets which are on the data lake. Some of them structured like Parquet and some of them are unstructured like CSV or TSV. When you start using indexing, the interesting aspect is all the indexes are also stored on the data lake, which is actually quite different compared to if you were anyways, you know, using an engine like SQL Server or PostgreSQL, you will know that indexes are internal to a particular engine. But in this particular case, all of the indexes are stored on the data lake, which means you can go play around with them, you can explore them and whatnot, essentially. This is one of the primary goals in hyperspace that we want to make everything open so that you understand what, what's really happening behind the scenes. And uh, our primary focus has been on, you know, building this indexing infrastructure, which gives you the ability to create and maintain indexes. And I'll show you a demo shortly. Okay. And in addition to this, um, my team has spent quite a lot of time in terms of going ahead and teaching Spark's optimizer how to utilize an index. So, so that you know, when you start making any queries, you don't need to think about, okay, should I now switch my query in order to start using the index? We've, we've taken care of all of those things. So that your workloads with just a simple flip of a configuration can start leveraging the power of indexing in order to accelerate some of your queries without you intervening at any point in time. In addition to that, we're also working on some VNext projects like index recommendation. For instance, if you manage to tell us 
here's you know a workload that I want you to kind of consider. We might be able to tell you like here are some best indexes that you could consider building on top of it. And all of this, uh, you know, if you're uh, if you're looking at this and thinking, man, there's a lot, then one of our primary goals has been to put this layer on the top, which gives you very clean APIs, which are super simple to use. Uh, you don't you don't really need to understand any of the complexity behind it, and that's been like one of our uh, primary goals essentially. Oh, that sounds good. And uh, Cheryl, uh, one other thing, let me show how easy it is uh, you know, for somebody to get started on uh, you know, using the indexing piece itself. So the usage API in hyperspace is divided into uh, two portions. One is the API that pertains to just using hyperspace itself. So you'll see things like create index, delete index, Right. Um, restore index. For instance, if you accidentally deleted something, you can end up restoring it immediately because it's a soft delete. You could also vacuum an index, gaining back all of the space that you ended up you know, using in order to build that index. Or because indexing could be a long running process, you could also go ahead and cancel the operation so that you, know, you can basically take the system back into uh, a good state essentially. And there are also these uh, newer APIs that we started working on, uh, which you know, which are more like smarts to hyperspace, but they won't affect in, in any way you know, your interaction with the library itself. One of the APIs is explain, and I'll cover this in, in the demo. And the others are what if and recommend. So both of them have to do something with index recommendation, and uh, yeah, we won't cover that in today's talk. There's also a lot of customization that you can do. Again, what, what I will show you in today's demo is pretty uh, fairly limited view of hyperspace, but you know we do recommend that you check out most of the documentation and we have links at the end of the talk, so you can go check it out on your own essentially. Wow, I love all of these options that are here. You know, it looks like it's pretty simple to use. Can you tell me how the indexes are stored and, and where they're stored at? Yeah, this is a great question. So like I said, remember, um, you know, I was saying that the indexes live side by side next to your data. So let me let me put that into perspective. So imagine, you know, you have a file system root. For instance, this is your storage that you attach into uh, Synapse. If you've ever used Synapse, then at the time you create a Synapse workspace, you end up providing a primary storage. And think of this as that primary storage. So imagine that you have your data sitting here where it says path to data and you have all of your data files right here. When you start creating a hyperspace index, what ends up happening is there is a folder called slash indexes that gets created in, in like your Synapse directory, which is on the primary storage. And what you will notice is immediately the name of the index that you provide will appear as a folder name right here. And in addition to that, there's something else called the hyperspace log, which captures all of the operations that ever took place on that particular index so that Hyperspace can understand, you know, what is the state of the index? Is it active? Is it disabled? Is somebody else trying to use that index? Is somebody else trying to perform any maintenance operations? So when you, you know, when you start creating that index, it constructs the entire index, stores it on the data lake, which is the cool aspect of hyperspace. It doesn't really try to hide anything. It has all of the information right there on the file system for you to take a look at. And Imagine that the underlying data changed and you were to do a refresh, then it goes ahead and captures the refresh operation inside the hyperspace log. So you know that, hey, once I created the index, I also did a refresh in order to bring the index up to date to my underlying data itself. And then once the refresh operation finishes, it takes the index back into the active state, telling Spark that, hey, you can go ahead and start using this index. And uh, you know, once the ind index refresh happens, you will see that there are two new directories that are constructed. This is part of what we call as you know, versioning for the index, wherein you know your existing readers who are using the index will not be affected when they start reading it. Which is, which is, which is, if you think about it, it's actually very interesting because it gives you a multi-user concurrency model without having to worry about oh, I'm using the index, can the other person also start using the index? Essentially, and uh, and Cheryl, like one of the greatest advantages of having the index completely on the storage I'd like to mention here is there are three benefits. One, 
the index scan scales. Today you might have thought that, hey, I will just use a four core cluster or maybe an eight core cluster. Tomorrow, perhaps um, you know you you have some urgency essentially to get uh, some of the results for your you know, business logic. So you end up giving like 50 cores. No problem. It goes ahead and starts using those 50 cores in order to utilize and leverage the index itself. The second advantage is the indexes that hyperspace creates are stored in an open data format called Parquet. And one of the really interesting aspects here is any benefits that you've already been seeing with Parquet are things that you already get with the indexing aspect as well. So there's no need to worry that, oh, Microsoft is going ahead and inventing a new format. We're not. It's just an open format. So you can peek in and you, you can feel free to kind of start looking at how exactly are we leveraging those indexes themselves. And finally, everything is a serverless access protocol. One of the really interesting things here is because there is no dependency on any other service, one of the nice aspects that happens is it's a cheap solution. There is no need for you to pay any extra money. If you don't use the index, you don't pay anything essentially. So, you know, I hope that conveys the simplicity of the entire design behind hyperspace itself. Mm -hmm. Yep, this all looks great. So let me show you uh, one other thing. So like I mentioned, hyperspace, obviously this talk is about how can you use hyperspace inside Azure Synapse Analytics. So I'd like to take this moment to explain that, you know, hyperspace is available today inside Synapse Analytics. It has no additional JAR includes. You don't need to do anything, uh, you know, fancy in order to start using the system. It supports multiple languages, including Scala, Python, and .NET. It has seamless integration with the entire user interface itself. And we do recommend that you check it out. You can use your free Azure credits to check this out like today, in fact. So having said that, let me just um, show you a quick demo of hyperspace itself. Um, again, there is a link that we have included here, aka.ms slash hello hyperspace, and you can get pretty much the entire code that we are showing you today in this demo for, you know, just to check it out on your machine, in fact. Great. So this is uh, Synapse uh, Analytics. This is Azure Synapse Analytics. If you've never used it, uh, then you know you might be uh, you might be kind of wondering what all of these buttons are. Right now, I'm actually in the Develop button here. Um, the basic idea behind Develop is that I can start uh, creating notebooks and I can start writing code, which um, can be in any language. I'll explain this in a moment, but you know what I've done before this demo is essentially clicked on develop and then I did like an import of this notebook and it just appeared here. That's basically uh, the, the only thing that I've done. And uh, you will notice immediately that uh, this notebook says attached to a Spark pool and it also selects a particular uh, language. So if you are not able to see that, here's the, here's the particular language that I've chosen here. So in this case, it's Scala, but you can pick C Sharp or Python, like uh, you know whatever language you feel comfortable with. We we try to keep the APIs pretty consistent, so you don't really feel like you're losing anything here. So one of the interesting things about this demo that I'd like to highlight is there is some set, setup. You can ignore all of this setup here, but imagine like there are two tables that I've just created for the sake of this demo. One is called the departments table, the other one being the employees table. And all I've done is I've written the, that down into two files, employees.parquet and um, departments.parquet here. Mm -hmm. And right after that, um, I'm just reading the same data just to kind of confirm that the data has been written and I'll see that Spark is printing it out in a nice tabular format that, hey, this is the data that I've just inserted here. Now let's begin. That's basically it. So th that's the prerequisite. I've created the data that I needed to show you what exactly is hyperspace indexing. In order to use hyperspace, all you do is this. Import com.microsoft.hyperspace and you instantiate the hyperspace class. Right after that, you have the full ammunition of all the APIs that hyperspace exposes. And if you want to create an index, all you need to do is create something called as an index configuration. Uh, give the index a name. Give the index a particular name and tell hyperspace what are the columns you want to index and include. Again, we'll include all the uh, documentation links for you to check out exactly you know, what, what else can you do? What else can you play with here? But once you specify an index configuration, the interesting thing here that you can start doing is you can basically instruct hyperspace to do a create index, provide 
the pointer to your underlying data source. So if you've ever used SQL Server, this will be very similar, like you know, create index on table essentially, right? So that's the table that you're providing right here. And you're also specifying the index configuration that you'd like to uh, have hyperspace consider. Once that goes in, the index gets created and you can start using hyperspace indexes.show in order to see what are the indexes and what is their current state. In this particular case, it says that all the indexes were created and they are currently in the active state and it also gives you the index locations on your primary storage. Having said that, uh, you know, you can do a bunch of uh, maintenance operations like let's say you created an index by mistake, you can delete it. Uh, you can restore it back if you accidentally thought that you deleted it by doing the restore index API. So you provide the exact same name right here. But let me show you something cool. So this is all maintenance APIs. Yeah, you can get this pretty much straight from the notebooks or the documentation. But one of the frequent questions that we got from our users is how do I know if hyperspace is using an index? So using the index is as simple as just doing spark.enable hyperspace and you keep doing your queries as they are. And once you start uh, using the indexes, right, there is something called as an explain API that hyperspace provides, and you can use that this way, hyperspace.explain, and you provide the query that you have as input to this. Again, the use of this is explained in the documentation, so let's ignore that for the sake of our discussion right here. But in this case, once you do hyperspace.explain and provide me with your query, hyperspace is smart enough to figure out, okay, whether an index can be used, and here's what it actually explains. It says plan with indexes and plan without indexes, and it also highlights what exactly is the difference. And you'll see in the, in the difference, basically the, the location in which it is reading from has been switched. Mm -hmm. You see, like without the index, it's going ahead and reading it from data dash something, and hyperspace, once it did the optimizations and determined that, hey, I can use the index, it goes ahead and starts doing like indexes right here. So with that, you know, I, I do recommend that you check out this particular notebook and you know, this is the link if you want to uh, check out the code base as well. It's github.com slash Microsoft slash hyperspace. All of the code is right there. You, you know, we highly recommend that you check it out. Any questions you have, please feel free to ask on GitHub or in the next AMA session right there. Wow, thanks so much for showing that. That demo was really intuitive and I wanted to point out and really emphasize the fact that you use notebooks. It's such a great way to get data and everything documented in a way that's reusable and editable. So Azure Data Studios along with Hyperspace, man, that's great. You know what I'm curious about though, I wonder what does the performance look like? I'm glad you asked. So, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to um, specify here is let's talk about performance. I think this this uh, warrants a discussion. So uh, one of the caveats that we need to get into is hyperspace is not a silver bullet. So users still need to look at their workloads. They need to look at their queries. You know, in most cases, yes, the indexing actually helps, but in 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 a lot of cases, you know, you you'll have to be a little more careful. So what we have done is we've taken two industry standard benchmarks, which were derived from TPCH and TPC DS, and what we've observed is, you know, we did not really find any regressions for like uh, if you're if you're familiar with TPCH, uh, this is a workload derived from TPCH benchmark. We did not see any regressions in all the 22 queries, and in some cases we've seen gains of up to 9x, but you will also see that there are queries where you've had no gain at all. It's about 1.1x. Yes, you did end up creating an index, but there's not much uh, you know, uh, performance gain to be had. It's the same thing with TPC DS as well. So yeah, we've not, we've not really observed any regressions there, instead like 11x gain. So, um, Again, we do recommend that you play with hyperspace, determine what's right for you. Again, if you land into any uh, scenarios or questions you have for my team, feel free to ask us on GitHub essentially. But overall, there is about a 2x gain that we've seen for the workload derived from TPCH and 1.8x uh, for TPC DS. But keep this in perspective. There is absolutely uh, no hardware acceleration. This is all running on commodity hardware essentially. There's no specialized hardware that we've used and we got this you know, gain for free pretty much like with, at the cost of additional storage. 
So having said that, I just wanted to reiterate that Hyperspace is an open source project. Uh, we've included the links right here for you to check it out. Um, feel free to check it out. It's, uh, it's it's also something if you if you do not want to use Hyperspace on Azure Synapse Analytics, feel free to not use it. Like the, the goal is not to really sell you Azure Synapse at this point. You know, you can use this uh, out of box with any other open source Apache Spark distribution as well. You hit into problems, please feel free to yeah, open questions on GitHub and and of course contributions are welcome. If you feel that hey some feature is missing, don't block on my team. Like your fee, you can feel free to look at how we develop on GitHub. You, more contributions are actually welcome. That's great. You know, it, I wonder, are you guys done with development? No, not at all. Actually, we're uh, you know rather than being done, we're beginning to start on this project. There's a huge roadmap in front of us. We, we just focused on these three aspects to begin with, which is, you know, how do you create indexes? How do you incrementally maintain them? What happens if your underlying data changes and whatnot? But uh, we're just getting started on some of these areas. We we have some prototype, like we have some V0 versions of this already open sourced essentially, and you, you can check it out on, on GitHub itself. But there are also other areas that we started thinking about, which is how would you build index recommendation how would you do caching of indexes? For instance, if you want to continue reusing the index inside Spark, how would you go ahead and do that? There's also debuggability. Uh, indexing is good as long as you know it is being used, but what, what do you do one day when suddenly hyperspace determines that I'm not going to use your index? How will you debug and say that, oh, you know, I know, I now know where, um, why hyperspace is not really using the index itself. And in addition to this, um, again, you, you, people can feel free to contribute. There are multiple types of hyperspaces. What we covered uh, today in our talk is the covering index, but there are so many other like indexes that we could collaborate and build on. And again, if you're interested in any of uh, these, feel free to reach, us, uh, reach out to us on GitHub and we'll, we'll help you gladly there to get started. Um, having said that, you know, let's recap. So today we talked about hyperspace. It's an extensible indexing subsystem for Apache Spark. It's a simple add-on. There is absolutely no changes that you need to do to Apache Spark to get this working. It works out of the box with open source Apache Spark. We support three languages, Scala, Python, and .NET. Um, in our initial evaluations, it did show us accelerated performance on some of the standard industry workloads. And, uh, we did open source the code base. It is definitely not perfect, but that's where we need your guidance. We want to understand where to start investing in this area. And uh, please feel free to give us any feedback, either on GitHub directly, or I'll also be available in the next AMA session. Cheryl, myself, and one more colleague of mine, essentially. So thanks a lot. Man, I, I can't wait to try all this out. Is it already available on Synapse? Yes, uh, so, uh, like you know, if you haven't really heard the news, Synapse has already gone GA as of last week, uh, which is December 3rd. Satya has announced it, and Hyperspace is available out of the box right there. You can play with it. You can play with the exact same notebook that I showed you today. Man, I can't wait to try it. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Um, thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, for the audience that's with us at the moment, please note that I've dropped the link for the following session. If you enjoyed this content, if you have questions related to it, the next session starting in just a minute will um, be available for you to ask questions, really get into the grid of it uh, with these wonderful experts coming live with us from Microsoft. Um, I dropped the link in there, so just use that to uh, access that next call. If you are busy on the following time window, we will be featuring this event again later today. We also will be recording these sessions and posting them to our reactor channel. Um, if you are not familiar with our reactor channel, I dropped the link for the YouTube there as well. So just check that out. And Sorry, just posting the link up to one second, please. Um, Raul, Cheryl, thank you so much for your Thanks. time with us today. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, you are more than welcome to pop off onto the next one. I will just leave this information up related to the reactor for an extra minute here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. 
So again, if you are not part of our community yet, if you're interested in joining our community, uh, these are some helpful links to do so. Our YouTube, um, our Twitter, we have an email now that we send out monthly with event information, our Microsoft Reactor website, which, you know, if you're not part of Meetup, um, this is another area where we have all of our events listed. So you can feel free to visit there as well. Um, and again, if you, um, you know, want to submit a survey, want to give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, so just enter that 12546 when you click on the survey link. Thank you so much and see you at the next one. At this time, we're going to end this session. Thank you.